Let me start with a quick recap. Um, so this week we started talking about uh, angular momentum and general rotation. This is chapter 11. So on, on Monday, we started with uh, a higher level overview of angular momentum and rotation about it, uh, a fixed axis. And we showed that angular momentum defined this way shows us that torque is equal to change of this L, like dl dt is equal to torque. This is similar to F is equal to dp dt. And if torque was zero, change in L was zero, then L was conserved and we could use this in solving certain problems. So later we introduce a vector nature of this angular momentum and for a rotation around a symmetry axis, we said that L vector was equal to moment of inertia times the omega angular vo velocity vector. So we introduced cross product to make th these things more systematic and we showed that torque was equal to R cross F and angular momentum L was equal to R cross P. And from here, we had this vectorial identity for an inertial frame. Total torque was equal to change in momentum as vector equation. So we um, generalized this to systems of particles and we showed that net external torque in a system is sum of individual changes in the angular momentum. And we also showed this important corollary. If we are talking about center of mass, we showed that this dl dt around center of mass was equal to torque around center of mass. So we showed these things for rigid bodies and we showed that angular momentum for a symmetrical object can be calculated as a component along the rotation vector and a component perpendicular to rotation vector. And for this specific problem, we showed that these components perpendicular to the rotation vector were canceling each other, giving us a final angular momentum vector along the rotation angular rotation vector. And we saw some problems. And I think finally, we showed that, for example, you can drive the Kepler law from the conservation of angular momentum. Okay. So maybe we can start with this problem as a warm up exercise. So this is the first suggested problem. Show that the cross product of two vectors, A, and B with their components is given by A cross B, this expression. And then B show that this result can be written as a determinant where we use the rules for evaluating a determinant. Note, however, that this is not really a determinant but a memory aid, okay? Since this is simple, maybe I can go ahead and start. So first we want to use what we know, what we know is that from the cross product I cross I equal to J cross J equal to K cross K is equal to zero. And now the non-zero elements I cross J, so I can cyclically follow these vectors. I cross J is going to give me K so J cross K is going to give me I, J cross K is going to give me I, and K cross I is going to give me J. K cross I is going to give me J. And we can, from here, we can use the anti-symmetry of cross product to show that J cross I is minus K, K cross J is minus I and I cross K is minus J. Okay, I can delete this. And now I can look at this problem and calculate its components. For example, I can start with a component along I direction. So I can say it like this, uh, A cross B. So I know the I component is going to come from crosses of this form or this form. There is no other option. So I need to cross J component with K component. 
So this is going to be a i b z and for this one i need to cross k component with y component and there will be a minus sign due to this minus minus a a z b y and you can calculate the other ones in a similar fashion i'm not going to do that but i will do the second one so b this determinant a cross B, we did this, but let's repeat it. It doesn't take too long. So this is I, J, K, A, X, A, Y, A, Z, B, X, B, Y, B, Z. And our rule is plus minus plus. And we set I, and we close this column and this, and we take a times b minus a times b this is going to be a y b z minus a z b y the second one is minus so this is j and i close this column and this and i look at this square composed of these little components so it's going to be a x b z minus a, Z, B, X, and lastly, plus, plus K. And I look at this last chunk, A, X, B, Y, minus A, Y, B, X, okay? And you need to verify for you now, this component matches this, and you need to do this for the other ones, which is not hard, okay? So if no questions, let's continue with the second one. Here's the problem. So two lightweight rods of 24 centimeter in length are mounted perpendicular to an axle at 180 to each other, like in this figure. At the end of each rod is a 480 gram mass. The rods are spaced 42 centimeter apart along the axle, like this separation. The axle rotates at 4.5 radian per second. What is the component of the total angular momentum along the axle? And B, what angle does this vector, this total angular momentum vector make with the axle, like with this axle? And there's like a hint, remember that the vector angular momentum must be calculated about the same point for both masses. And this point could be center of mass. Any suggestion is better than no suggestion. So you can just write how you would start and we can speculate over that, which can actually help us. Maybe free body diagram, okay? So this problem is about angular momentum. And what one thing we should get from angular momentum, maybe finding L and T, like, angular momentum and torque, okay. So what can you write from like first step, L? What can you write about L? What is L in its most general form, right? So this, you may think it is like I omega, but it, is it really? Right? We want to write it as a vector. And we saw that this may not be actually, yes, like there is like a, you may think about MVR, but the more mathematically correct way of writing this is R cross P, right? And P is in general M times V as a vector. Okay, that's it. So now let's just choose, let's just think about this. Remember that vector angle momentum must be calculated about the same point. So this R should be calculated from the same point for this and this guy. So let's find this point. Maybe I can connect them like this, something like that. And here is their center of mass. And now I can calculate R 
from here to here for this mass and from here to here for this mass. So let me start with the first one. So this is my R. And so this is a rotation like this. And at the instant this picture is taken, I can zoom in and look, for example, let's use a different color. Maybe the green is a little bit better. So let's look at the axis is here. This is how the coordinate system is. At the moment, this picture is taken. This is X, this is Y, this is Z. And when this picture is taken, this is the velocity, right? This is out of page because this thing is rotating along this curve. So instantaneously, it's going to be tangent to that line and this tangent is going to be out of page. So this is going to be V, if you like V1. So now I can call, I can use my right hand rule. Right hand rule is like says that if you have a vector like A cross B to find the result, curl your fingers along A and follow B and stick your thumb out, it's going to be the direction of A of B. So imagine you are curving your fingers like this. This is R. We are going to cross it with P. So we have to turn the direction like this. So this is your finger direction. So if you stick your thumb out, this is the direction of the angular momentum. And you can see this angular momentum is going to be on the plane that's formed by this Y and Z axes. So let's write this. So this is L. And with this similar approach, you can say that this is R. And this one is going to be into the page because this is also rotating in the same. And at this moment, it is going in. So curl your fingers along R, follow this into the page, stick your thumb out. So this is the angular momentum. So the other one is also like this. So we know the direction. So let's calculate this R cross P. So I can delete this now. So this. L, its magnitude is like exactly like you said, this is MV, um, MVR, right? So this is like, we need to, we need to find, okay. So this R is obviously, okay, maybe I can label this. So this is, let's call this little r, let's call this H, and let's call this R, and we know from Pythagorean theorem, this R is equal to R square plus H square. And let's calculate this, not to come back later. So this is 24 times 24 plus 21 times 21 is equal to, and I take the square root, this is 31.9, 31.9 centimeters. So this is equal to M. So V is like, I need to write V here in terms of what I know. And what I know is this angular velocity, like this omega. And do you guys remember how to write V in terms of omega? Exactly, right? We are experts on circular motion now. So this is going to be M omega times so this is little r, I need to fix my notation because this one, I said this is from this origin, right? So let's fix this, this is going to be r, this is going to be r, so this is m omega r, this is v, and this is going to be r. So this is L1, if you like. And there's a similar term L2, which is m omega r r, so total L, we can sum this vector with this vector and we can write it here to make sure it is like some of these two. So this vector, let me draw this L. So L is equal to two M omega R times R. And let's see what the question is. What is the component of total angular momentum along the axle? And so we are asked to find, we are asked to find component of this vector along this. And this vector has two components, one along the axle, one perpendicular, and the problem are asking us this. So then let's say L omega is equal to two M 
omega r r and this angle we need to find cosine of this angle but we know cosine of this angle is sine of this angle let's call this phi because we can calculate phi from here sine of phi is going to be this divided by this and this is equal to sine phi which is equal to r divided by r so it seems like these two guys cancel so this is equal to 2 m omega r squared let's calculate these numbers 0 0.25 0 0.25 kilogram meter sector by second okay hopefully you guys find the same same thing so the second question is what angle does the vector okay what angle does the vector angle moment make with the axle we saw that that angle is here so that angle is 90 minus this angle so let's see so angle between l i, I think you can do something like this angle between l and omega is equal to 90 degrees so 90 90 degrees minus okay minus this angle but this angle is inverse tangent of this divided by this so let's write this tangent to the minus one 24 divided by 21 it should be equal to okay i have 41 point okay this is something like 40 1.2 degrees. All right, let's just go to the next problem. So this is 51, a thin rod of mass M and length L rests on a frictionless table and is stuck at a point L over. So this is like actually from the top. I guess this is the table. And so this is from the top and we are drawing this thing and is stuck at a point L over four from its center of mass by a clay ball of mass, little m, moving at speed v. The ball sticks to the rod. Determine the translational and rotational motion of the rod after the collision. How do we start? Momentum, okay, exactly. So we start with momentum. So we know that we have to define both the translational. Okay, this is a question asking. Is asking us to define translational and rotational motion. Okay, let's first start with translational motion. We had a lot of experience with that. And exactly like you said, momentum is conserved. So initially, so I say linear momentum is conserved so initially it is m v so everything is in 1d so let me just forget our vectors to make it a little bit quicker and this should be equal to total mass after the collision which is little m big m times some v center of mass let's call this prime because we generally show uh, objects after collision with prime so I can solve this for V center of mass prime is equal to M over M plus M times V. Okay, so let's box this is out here. Now, what about rotational motion? So first, maybe I can start with a hint. So when this ball is stuck, here like here so before this the center of mass of the rod was here now there is like an extra mass so the center of mass will change so we need to find this point on the rod and we will say this point whatever that point is going to move with this uniform velocity v center of mass prime so let's do this so let's find the 
center of mass. And I think I can be a little bit quick here too. Like if this is like here, let's call this X and let's call this, I don't know, one over four L minus X. So I know if this is the center of mass, the mass coming from here should balance the extra mass coming from here. So the equation would be something like X times M should be equal to um, one over four L minus X times little m. Then I think I can take everything on one side m plus uh, m x is equal to one over four l times m. Then x is equal to one over four m divided by m plus m times l. Why did linear momentum conserve? Isn't there a nail on earth? No, no nail, no. This whole thing is free. This dot is just, yeah, this is a little misleading, but this dot is just put to indicate that it is the, uh, it is the center of mass. Otherwise it's like, it's like it rests on a frictionless table and it can move anyway. It's good point. Thanks for your clarification. Okay, now I have the center of mass and I know how the center of mass moves this uniform velocity. So I can choose my inertial frame, choose center of mass with uniform, or maybe I can say it a little bit English, with constant speed or a constant velocity actually, velocity as inertial frame, okay? I want to choose this inertial, in this inertial frame, which is the new center of mass. If you like, this is center of mass prime because this is after collision, it shifted a little bit. And I want to calculate everything with respect to here. So initially, initial angular momentum is, right, it is like, mv times this distance, which is one over four L minus X, but one over four L minus X is what? One over four M over M plus ML. This is going to be equal to one over four M over M plus M times L, right? So initial angular momentum is then M V one over four big M little m plus big M times L. So final, the L final is after the collision and this should be equal to this new speed here. Like this whole thing moves with this, but this clay here has like some, let's call this V prime that's coming from the angle rotation. So let's write it. M V prime and its distance is the same, one over four M over M plus M times L. And this second one is I, but this I is supposed to be calculated according to this point though. So I, let me call this I mu times, let's call this omega prime. So I, this I new, I can calculate from parallel axis theorem, right? So I new is previously, if you look at your table, I think you are going to find something like this. One over 12 M L squared. And parallel axis theorem says, this new one should be M times H squared, where H is the distance to the center of mass. And this distance is X in this case. So I can just put X squared rather than H squared. And X squared is, what, one over four M over M plus M L squared. So let me take this inside the parentheses one over 12 um, 
L squared one plus, okay. What will be left if I take the parentheses? Uh, I think let me see three over four. M is gone. This is going to be M square or M plus M square and that's it. Okay, now I can substitute it here and let's do this. So this is one, one over 12 and L square omega prime. And this is one plus three over four M square over M plus M squared. And now I can delete this guy. I don't need this anymore. So I have V prime and W prime, but I can relate this V prime to W prime, right? So this V prime, maybe I can use this color. We know it is like omega prime times R, but the radius of rotation is simply, what? It is simply this distance, which is one over one over four, m over m plus m times l. So I have one guy here, the other one here. So it's going to be square, right? So let's write this as so. Maybe I can actually write it in this line. So I just replace this one with omega prime and I take square of here. Okay, now everything is in terms of omega prime, omega prime omega prime. So let's also take another parenthesis here. So maybe this one is better, one over, okay. This one, okay. This is one over 12. So this is big M L squared omega prime. Okay, let's see what's left. So if I take this guy from this guy, what is left will be, um, so first three over four to make, so this guy is going to be 16, 16 times three over four will be, okay, that's, I got it. So the second one is, okay, M is there, I need to put M, I need to put M because there are m squares and one is outside, so what's left is m. So I will divide this thing with m plus m squared. So plus, so this one times this, it's going to be just one plus, and this thing is going to come as it is, three over four, m squared over m plus M squared. Now I can see, okay, there's like a more I can take out. So I can take out this three over four, this, this, and one of the M's. Let me do this. This is one over 12. This is big M L squared omega prime, three over four. So I'll take out m over m plus m squared. So if I do this, here is only m left. So this is m plus, so I need to put inverse of this. So this is four over three m plus m squared over m. And from here only m squared is left, m is left, okay, good. Now it's like being resolved a little bit. I have m plus m and I have m plus m squared here. So let's take this outside the parenthesis. So, okay, this is equal to one over 12, m l square omega prime three over four m, m plus m squared m plus m, so this is going to be one plus four over three, m plus m over m. Okay, now I can calculate here, 
this is going to be three m plus this is going to be seven m plus four m divided by three m. So what did we say? We said angular momentum should be conserved. So this whole thing should be equal to this. Let's put them next to each other and try to see if anything cancels. Okay, let's cancel everything you can cancel. So I see one M plus one, one here, another one, this one goes with this one, good. So what else do I have here? So I have M here, M here, I have M here, M here, I have L here, L square here, so I'm only left with L. I have four, four, and three. This is gone with four, right? Do I have anything left? I think that's it. What is left is V and omega prime. And I can solve this for omega prime. Let's write this. Omega prime is equal to three M over seven M plus four M. And this is times V over L. Okay, V over L, V over one over four, one over four. V over L. Actually, this four, I think, um, I think this four should go. So this is like a denominator here. This should multiply here. So it is going to be actually one, not one over four, but times four. So this one is something like that. This is 12, 12 and, and this one. Okay, maybe I can box this in to make it a little bit more visible. And we need to calculate this L with respect to a, um, a, um, an inertial frame that's important. And this inertial frame is center of mass, right? Because this center of mass, which after the collision shifted a little bit like this, is going to move with uniform velocity, V center of mass prime. So if you put our coordinate system right in there, right, our coordinate system is moving with V center of mass prime, and it is right in the center of mass. So I can just forget about this translational motion and calculate everything in this primed coordinate. And that's what I do. And initially, so in this initial, angular momentum is like this. And final mo angular momentum is like this. These are a lot of line, but I just manipulated those. I think I might have missed some factors here. You can go over this calculation again, but otherwise the idea should be like this. So the L initial, this one. So um, it's like M V R, right? R is the distance to the center of mass or perpendicular distance to the center of mass. And if you look at this, this is MV and it is perpendicular distances like this, one over four L minus X. And one over four L minus X happens to be one over four uppercase M divided by lowercase M plus uppercase M times L. So, okay, um, so this part, you know, you have to do a lot of like factors, blah, blah, and you know, you know, um, but these are all cosmetic changes, right? I had to factor everything out, to make the cancellations nicely, but you don't have to do it that way. What you need to do is to recognize angular momentum is conserved and you need to calculate this and this And then you are good to go. All right. I think I have one more question. Maybe we can quickly go over it if you don't have any questions. And that will be it. So a bicyclist traveling with speed V is equal to 9.2 meter per second on a flat road is making a turn with radius R is equal to 12 meters. 
there's like some turning along that radius. The forces acting on the cyclist and cycle are the normal force. Okay, let me clean that. The normal force, friction force exerted by the road on the tires and mg, the total weight of the cyclist and cycle. Ignore the small mass of the wheels and explain carefully why the angle theta the bicycle makes with the vertical must be given by tangent theta is equal to f friction by f theta if the cyclist is to maintain balance. And B, calculate theta for the values given. There's like a hint. Consider the circular translational motion of the bicycle and rider. And see if the coefficient of static friction between tires and road is mu is equal to 0.65, what is the minimum turning radius? So maybe I can start with the first one. So A. So if it is remain balanced, right? And if the this guy is not falling this way or this way. That means total torque in the system is zero. Otherwise it would be like, right? It would be rotating in one way or another. And I would say if total torque is zero, then I think I, I can calculate torque with respect to center of mass. And I have two forces. One is this normal force and the other one is friction force but this mg is acting on the center of mass, which is my reference point. So I can, I don't need to take this for total torque. So this is going to be Fm times, okay. So if I call this distance L, Fm times L times, okay, so maybe I can do this. So this is theta, this is, 90 minus theta, this is 90 minus theta, this one is theta. So FL times cosine of this angle is sine of this angle. So this is sine theta minus F friction times cosine of this angle, which is L times cosine theta should be zero. Then I think I can get rid of these Ls. Fm times sine theta is equal to F friction times cosine theta and tangent theta then should be equal to what? Uh, F friction divided by F normal. Okay, so B, calculate theta for the given values. Okay, say, okay, we know there's no motion along this direction. So then I know Fn should be equal to mg. And F friction is what? So F friction, of course there are, it's like mu times mg, but that's not given. So we are supposed to calculate it from this circular motion. So this guy is doing this circle and we know circular motion. If this is circle, this is like this. So we know this mv square over r should come from this friction. So we can just write this like this and v squared over r. So let's see if everything is given. v is given, r is given, and that's it. And we want to calculate theta. So tangent theta is equal to mv squared over r over mg. Cancel these m's. This should be equal to v squared over gr. And if I calculate that, which is equal to 35.7. To 35.7 degrees. 
T, if the coefficient of static friction between tires and road is this, what is the minimum turning radius? Okay, maybe we are out of time. I can let you guys do this as a homework C. Calculate minimum turning radius. I don't want to hold you guys for any longer. Any, okay, that's the end, at least for me. Thanks for coming. Maybe I'll see you guys next week.